Welcome back, dear viewer. We have finally, finally reached the first major milestone in the history of motorsport, a race whose legacy can be seen today in every single Formula One race. This is the 1906 Grand Prix de la Automobile Club de France, or more simply, the 1906 French Grand Prix. So how did this race differ from what we've seen before, and from what we would recognise as a Grand Prix today? And why was it seen as a failure by the organisers? Please do like and subscribe, and let's go. Right off the bat, I'm going to preempt some comments saying, I can't believe you forgot about the 1901 Poe Grand Prix, which was actually the first. It bloody well wasn't, so let's clear this up. It essentially comes down to not a mistranslation from French, but a misinterpretation. Because the 1901 Circuit de Sud-Ouest race, which started and finished in the city of Pau, included prizes which were awarded to the winner of each class. The prize awarded for the biggest and heaviest cars was indeed called the Grand Prix de Pau. So the grand part of the Grand Prix was meant for the cars and not the prize. Understood? Probably not. Let's carry on. I don't know what the base knowledge is for people going into this, so I'll give a brief recap of what came before, and why the Grand Prix exists in the first place. If you don't know about races preceding this one, I have a playlist dedicated to racing history called Racing History. Anyway, the French. <laughs> Specifically, it was the Automobile Club de France, or ACF, who were the first organisation to think hosting events around the horseless carriage would be a good idea. The first of these was held in 1894, which wasn't really a race anyway, as the prizes were awarded by car design rather than speed, but the ACF would continue to put on these annual events on public roads, usually starting from Paris and finishing in another city. By 1900, an eccentric man called James Gordon Bennett Jr. made his mark on motor racing, as he commissioned the ACF to hold an annual race between nations for a trophy, the Gordon Bennett Cup. The French won the first cup in 1900, the second in 1901, they were the only ones in it to be fair, Britain the third race, Germans the fourth, and the French again for the fifth and sixth editions. These races were run with some restrictions, with the most notable one being that each nation was limited to just three cars, essentially giving countries an equal chance of winning, regardless of the size of each nation's car industry. This was the rule that the French kicked up such a stink over. Interest by manufacturers to enter the cup surged for the final couple of editions, which forced our Frankish friends to hold race trials to see who would represent them. For the final cup race, there were 29 entries for the French trial, and only the top three could race in the cup. This was the final straw, as the ACF felt they couldn't flex their automotive muscles, so they gave the cup back to James Gordon Bennett, and they decided that they would host their own major race. With blackjack and hookers! So yes, the whole point of Grand Prix racing, which would give rise to Formula One and the World Drivers' Championship, was just so the French could show off. National pride was in vogue in the early 20th century in Europe, let me tell you. The ACF had learned their lesson regarding race venues after 1905. The spiritual predecessor to this race, the 1905 Gordon Bennett Cup, was twisty and mountainous. For this first Grand Prix, the course was a combination of long straights and corners, but also the course was pretty flat. Now, don't get confused here. This course was near the city of Le Mans, and was christened the Circuit de la Sarthe. But this triangular layout of roughly 100 kilometers has nothing to do with the circuit we currently know as the Circuit de la Sarthe, the home of the 24 Hours of Le Mans. The 1906 circuit was to the east of the city, while the 24 Hour circuit is to the south, and at no point do they overlap. A poorly pronounced French names trigger warning is in effect. The start-finish line was outside the village of Montfort, about 16 kilometers outside of Le Mans, and the drivers would head off in a southwesterly direction. After a couple of kilometres, they'd reach the first point of the triangle, a sharp hairpin which would send them off to the east and into the countryside. They would head in a straight line to Boulois and then on to Saint-Calais, a route which you can experience for yourself on the D357 motorway. Eventually, you'll reach the aforementioned Saint-Calais. The cars would avoid going through the town itself out of safety concerns, so instead it was bypassed using roads made from very slippery wooden planks put in place specifically for the event. This replaced the Gordon Bennett method of using control zones, where cars would pass through town centres at reduced speeds. Our racers would turn north up to Vibray, where again the town centre was bypassed by wooden planks, 
and the route continued up to La Ferte Bernard, turning around again to point back towards the start finish line. The last town before the lap was completed was Conneret, where we can see the Palisade fencing at the side of the road to keep the cars and spectators separate. One lap of this triangle was 103 kilometers or 64 miles. Who would race in his first Grand Prix? Well, the whole point of the thing was so the French could enter more than three cars. Did they? Oh boy, did they. There were 10 French manufacturers, including the likes of Clément Bayard, Brazier, formerly of Richard Brazier, De Dietrich, Panard et Leveso, and Renault. There were only three other teams in the race which weren't French. The German Daimler Mercedes team and the Italians with Fiat and Itala. No British or Americans entered because they didn't want to involve themselves in what they considered a propaganda event. Can't really blame them. I mean, listen to this extract from the French publication Le Petit Parisien. If we win, the Grand Prix shall let the whole world know that the French motor cars are the best. If we lose, it shall merely be by accident, and our rivals should be grateful to us for having been sufficiently sportsmanlike to allow them an appeal against the bad reputation of their cars. What a strange person! Each team could run up to three cars, which the vast majority did. The numbering system was a little strange for this first Grand Prix. Teams were randomly assigned a number, then the drivers were assigned a letter. So starting from the top, the Dietrich were assigned to number one, and they had a very strong trio of drivers to compete in the 120 horsepower Lorraine Dietrich. Fernand Gabriel, 1A, Henri Rougier, 1B, and Arthur Dure, 1C. In the slightly more powerful 130 horsepower Fiat, it was Vincenzo Lancia, 2A, Felice Nazaro, 2B, and Aldo Valshot, 2C. 90 horsepower entries from Renault, Ferenc Cis, 3A, Jacques Edmond, 3B, and Claude Richet, 3C. The Darak machines had 120 horsepower and were driven by Victor Emery, 4A. Louis Wagner 4B and René Henrio 4C. Automobile Brazier 105 horsepower. Paul Barra 5A, Jules Barrier 5B and Gabi Huguet 5C. Running number 6, the 120 horsepower Daimler Mercedes. Driver A was split as Camille Giannazzi would race on day 1 and Joseph Burton Alexander would take over for day two. Thank you to subscriber Gary24Fan, who pointed out to me that Alexander Burton and Joseph Burton Alexander are in fact the same person. 6B, it was a him, Mario, no other identity exists for them, and Vincenzo Florio, 6C. Louis Rigolet was the sole entry for the 110 horsepower Gobron Brouillet, which sounds like a French knockoff of Gordon Bennett. Alessandro Cagno, Maurice Fabri, and Baron Pierre de Carter would drive the 120 horsepower Italas, running the number 8. Number 9, it was the woefully underpowered Grégoire et Company, who I've never heard of before. Just 70 horsepower, and they were driven by the duo of Philippe Taverneau and Javier Seville de Bosch. Feels wrong to refer to any team as the old guard, seeing as this was still motor racing in its infancy but that's the feeling Panar Elevasor gives off. They were an ever-present in the Paris races and the first Gordon Bennett Cups, but other manufacturers had since surpassed them. They ran number 10 for their 130 horsepower cars, which were driven by George Heath, Henri Tart, and George Testi. I know it's pronounced Test, but I refuse to accept that. Automobile Volpe, also a one driver team, Marius Barrio, 11A. Number 12, Etz Hotchkiss, with their drivers Hubert Leblanc, Jacques Saleron, and Elliot Shepard. Finally, and lucky for some, number 13 was the Clement Bayard team. Their A driver was unsurprisingly Albert Clement, son of the founder and the pre race favourite, B. A. Bielman, and the final entry, 13C, De La Toulobre. That's it for the teams, but we must mention another brand involved in this race, as their presence would prove to be critical for those who took advantage. Michelin. The French tyre manufacturer had introduced detachable rims, known as jantes amovibles. What would normally happen is puncture tyres would have to be sliced off with a knife, and new inner tubes would then have to be fitted and inflated at the roadside. This would take between 10 to 15 minutes, but with the Michelin detachable rims, a tyre change would just take a couple of minutes. 
Only the Renaults, Fiats and two Clermont Bayards would run these tyres as there was a maximum weight limit for all cars. Yes, a maximum weight. The thinking at the time was a faster car had a bigger engine and a bigger engine meant more weight. Although this was the first Grand Prix, the race format was pretty unrecognisable from what we have today. No qualifying, staggered starts with drivers competing against the clock rally style, and this may come as a shock to a few of you, it was run over two days. Day 1, the 26th of June, a Tuesday, which is a strange day to have a race, 5am, strange time to start a race. The A drivers would set off first, starting with car 1, 2, and so on. Therefore, the honour of being the first starter in the first Grand Prix fell to Fernand Gabriel in the Diddy Trich, and just like me sitting at traffic lights as they turn green, he stalled. So the first driver to actually get going in the first race was driver of 2A, the Fiat of Vincenzo Lancia. The rest of the drivers followed in 90 second intervals, with the exceptions of cars 9A and 11A, Marius Barrio and the sole Volpe entry of Philippe Taverneau. The fastest driver in the first kilometre was Maurice Fabri in the Itala 8B car, the distance being covered in 43.4 seconds. That's an average of 83 km per hour, but that's as good as his day would get, as he was one of four drivers who failed to make a single 103 km tour. The other three were Gabriel, who got going after his stall only to suffer mechanical issues at Saint Calais, Javier Civelli de Bosch in the other Gregoire, and René Anrio in the 4C Darak. Fastest lap on lap 1, and therefore the race leader, was Brazier number 5. Paul Barra, with a time of 52 minutes and 25.4 seconds, at an average speed of 118 km per hour. I know the course was made up of mostly straights, but that's impressive for a 1906 car to maintain that kind of speed for the best part of an hour. Going on to the second lap, Barra extended his lead and Baron Pierre de Carter dropped out of the race leaving just one Itala left. That was until the very next lap when Alessandro Cagno also dropped out along with the Darek and Hotchkiss of Louis Wagner and Jacques Saleron, while Cisse in the Renault 3A took over the lead, as Barra lost approximately 70 minutes in tyre changes, which would become something of a recurring theme. It was a scorching hot day in central France, which was quite literally melting competitors' tyres. Cisse held this lead for the rest of day one. He had a time of 5 hours, 45 minutes and 30.4 seconds, the best part of a half-hour lead over Albert Clément in his father's machine. Felice Nazaro was the highest non-French runner in third place, another 15 minutes behind Clermont. In total, 17 cars made it through the first day. The remaining drivers who dropped out who we haven't mentioned were De La Toulobre, Henri Tart, Villemann, Vincenzo Florio in the Mercedes and Aldo Weichot in the Fiat. A real shame for the German, as he had made remarkable progress. 14th on lap 3, but he climbed up to 3rd by lap 5. Unfortunately, he managed to fall off the wooden planks at Vibre. The final driver to retire on the first day was the Renault of Jacques Edmond. In the days before asphalt, roads were either cobbled or dirt tracks, and the vast majority of this original Circuit de la Sarthe was the latter. Tar was laid along the track in an attempt to prevent all this dust flying up during the race, which is a good bit of planning, if not for one crucial fact, the sweltering heat and this tar began to melt. Poor Edmond, his goggles broke, so not only was there now loose dust being kicked up into his eyes, but also molten tar and small bits of glass. As per the rules, no equipment could be changed mid-race, so out of the very real potential of him being blinded, he pulled out of the race. As Cease had completed the day in 5 hours, 45 minutes and 30 odd seconds, he was the first competitor to head out on day 2, at 5.45 and 30 seconds in the morning. Albert Clément was 26 minutes slower on day 1, so he was the second off on day 2, 26 minutes after Cease. So now it feels like more of an actual race, as the physical distance between the cars was the genuine time gap too. No more start time intervals to mess around with. All cars were kept in Parc Fermé overnight, so both Cease and Clément were straight into the pits to change tyres and for some general maintenance. Cease was out of the pits 14 and a half minutes before Clément even set off, but the latter stop was faster, meaning he had slightly closed the gap. Further back in the pack, Burton Alexander was subbed in for Camille Genazzi, which seems like a massive downgrade. Vincenzo Lancia was also meant to be replaced for day two, but like Emile Levasseur in the 1895 Paris-Bordeaux Paris race, 
his replacement was nowhere to be found. Assuming his work was done, Lancia was back in the civvies and had to continue the race like this. The first driver out on the second day was 10C Georges Testi in the Panar, who crashed on the opening tour. He was joined on the next lap by Louis Rigolet in the Gobron Briet, Victor Emery in the Dirac, and Elliot Shepard in the Hotchkiss. The American was the fourth fastest on day one, but somehow on lap eight, he suffered a wheel failure, which made him lose control and crash into a bank. Sounds expensive. Oh, an earth bank. Never mind. Throughout the rest of the day, there would only be two more retirements. Claude Richet for Renault and Henri Rougier for the De Dietrich, putting the total number of DNFs at 21. At the front, C stretched his lead to over 30 minutes, while the big battle for the race, seemingly, was that of Clément and Azaro for second and third. The Frenchman was roughly 23 minutes ahead of the Italian by lap 8, but this was down to just 3 minutes on lap 9, and Azaro was passed by lap 10. The Fiat driver made a stop for fuel and fell back to third, but again he passed Clément, and they entered the final lap with Nazaro narrowly ahead by just one minute. Thrilling stuff. There was no stopping Renault 3A or Fairing Sis. Even damage to his suspension didn't slow him down that much. And with a total time of 12 hours, 12 minutes and 7 seconds, the Hungarian crossed the line to become the first ever winner of a Grand Prix. Half an hour behind him, Nazaro stretched his lead over Clement, and the two came home second and third to complete the podium. The rest of the finishers were Jules Barrier fourth, Vincenzo Lancia fifth, George Heath sixth, Paul Barra seventh, whose opening lap time was never bettered, meaning he's the holder of the first ever fastest lap in the Grand Prix. Arthur Jure eighth, Gabi Uguer ninth, the joint efforts of Camille Giannazzi and Joseph Burton Alexander tenth in the highest placed Mercedes. A disappointing showing by the German Mercedes, and it's a him, Mario in 11th. Four and a half hours slower than Cis. No wonder no one kept a record of who they were. The Michelin tyres on the Renault seem to have been the difference between Cis and the likes of Clermont. In total, Renault's tyres needed changing 19 times, which took roughly one and a half hours. In that time, it would have taken Clermont to change only five or six tyres. It does seem very fitting, therefore, that 100 years later, Renault on Michelin rubber would again reign supreme. The sale of Renault cars soared following the victory. 1,600 cars sold in 1906, 3,000 in 1907, and 4,600 in 1908. But remember, at the start I said this race was viewed as a failure. The whole point of the race was for the French to show off about how good their automotive industry was, and yet, if we look at the results again, Look how many French cars failed to finish. 18 DNFs. And yeah, Renault won the race, but that was their only car that went the distance. And both Fiat and Mercedes managed two finishes each. Let's look back to the Petit Parisien. If we win the Grand Prix, we shall let the world know that French motor cars are the best. You'll maybe want to eat those words. Those French motor cars seem a little fragile to me. Good tyres though. And that's pretty much it for this race. The French would organise a second Grand Prix in Dieppe for 1907, and the Germans would also get in on the act, running the Kaiser Prix the same year, the German Grand Prix in all but name. As the motor racing bug had truly bitten, more and more major races would be introduced up until 1914, and a major innovation would be seen between this race and the start of the First World War, and that's what I'll be looking at in the near future. Before we get to that though, there is just one more individual race I'd like to do. Possibly the strangest race to ever take place. Oh, but wait, there's still one final question that needs answering. What was the grand prize? Well, it was 45,000 French francs. Doesn't mean much to us now, but at the time, 0.29 grams of gold was the value of one franc. Meaning that 45,000 francs was the same value as 13 kilos and 50 grams of gold. Thank you for watching, Mostly Racing is a solo endeavour by yours truly, so if you're willing and able, please head over to my Patreon page and follow my Twitter. Thank you again, and I'll see you very soon.